She's got me tempted by the way her tongue moves when she's calling my name Not for my age, I'm just too young to walk a ball in a chain She keeps my head up in the air just like I'm tossing some change Well, it's the cost of exchanging talks It's all aboard if she says she wants to ride Come inside my train of thoughts Never conducted except for these tracks She loves my singing and I'm sure this book kept her attract Dead and texting her avid is what left it intact Comforting thoughts over using my chest as a mattress She's... I'm blinded by her self-pity, I'm blinded by myself, really. There probably could be more of us, uh, but every time we feel like closer, a wall forms before we. Your kiss is leaving me breathless, I'm not obsessed, I'm invested. No caution, baby, we reckless, needing it all, needing it all. No, it's not what we expected, but babe, this ain't nothing to mess with. My angel, baby, you bless this, give me all, I want it all. Oh, color me bad Leading me away And I want to use your palette Show me all your shades Show me all your shades Show me all your shades uh. Oh, color me bad Leading me away, and I want to hear your palate. Show me how your shades, show me how your shades, show me how your shades. Yeah. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh. yeah, 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 I just think it's how we go our separate ways You see I've been trying to look for better days I just had to get this off my chest Thought about it for a week It spilled over to the next love Judgment is clouded It's nothing but rain No wonder I'm drowning You tell me you want me I tell you that I'll think about it Really I doubt it Laying clothes can go What is your angle? I know what seemed rough on the surface Part of my curves You're making me nervous with that probably not not here to talk and say i'm sorry but i'm probably not won't be your fool you so cool because you got me hot won't even answer no more time to sell you guess i just forgot to tell you Lasso ended on a flat note Started like a bad joke There's no need to act so dumb Had hope Hitting highs are only for sopranos Now we know Baby we ain't on the right key uh, Baby we ain't on the right key Yeah yeah, 
uh, feeling like it's my fault. All the expectations I have for you from the jump, yeah. Mentally abused and things fell through when you had your view with the bumps. Something was missing that we couldn't fit in. This is no description of perfect. I wish that I listened to my intuition and maybe to fix it was worth it. You play with my heart like volleyball. I wish it was fine, but not at all. Got into my brain, discovered my pain, and use it as fuel for Molotovs. Another bridge that we have to burn. It's a lesson that we have to learn. Wish I could say that I'm mad, but I'm not that concerned. Cause I'm free from your lies. So ended on a flat note. Started like a bad joke. There's no need to act so dumb. Had hope. Hitting highs are only for sopranos. Now we know. Baby, we ain't on the right key. Uh. And baby, we ain't on the right key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. T O A, 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 T O. Yeah. Call me up, babe, hit my line. Call me up, babe, hit my line. Call me up, babe, hit my line. Sit with this liquor in my hand, I'm feeling motivated I'm wearing stussy and yeah, some Jordans like I know who made it I'm trying to get me in a homies plus the Copenhagen This swishy swishy make a book on how to cope with changing I'm in the fast lane, when goes in my eyelids Send me to the mines, cause baby want some diamonds I try not to stunt, uh, no evil can evil uh, What good are the memories when even they leave you uh, I'm trying to get what is mine, yeah Clock's only wasting my time, yeah Sticking my feet in the grime, yeah Do it dirty in the crime, yeah The tracks that I'm making divine, yeah Three below is up the spine, yeah In the mood for connection uh, The baby keep hitting my line, hitting my line, I I put that on everything Another party and it's look around everything It doesn't help me with everything I put that on everything Put that on everything Thought the stick you would have given me everything We sounds on everything uh. Thank you. Little more mic. She's looking at me. Her name is Marie. She's doing those things she knows she ain't supposed to, but nobody tells her no. But nobody tells her no. She's looking at me. Her name is Marie. She's the world's thing, she knows she ain't supposed to, but nobody tells her no. 
yeah. when nobody tells her no. Uh, know that your heart is your kryptonite Building a wall for the tricks and lies Hoping it falls with a different guy All of it fades with a kiss goodnight I know what you're thinking too Maybe there's something you need to do But nah, it's not the things you do One day they all gonna believe in you One, I know you're broken I see you crying, your soul is denying Come to me for sanctuary and peace Wait for berating, but now's not the timing And I know you've heard it Oh, so many others desert your call Thinking the drugs will reverse it all oh, She told me the climb isn't worth the fall Looking at me Her name is Marie She's doing her own thing She knows she ain't supposed to But nobody tells her No But nobody tells her no but she's looking at me Her name is Marie She's doing all things she knows she ain't supposed to But nobody tells her no But nobody tells her no Nobody You say it's only a game Please don't get carried away, away. Uh, Looking for somewhere to stay Please don't get carried away, away. Uh, I know you just want to play Please don't get carried away, away Looking for someone to stay Please don't get carried away, away. Looking at me Her name is Marie She's doing all stay, she knows she ain't supposed to, but nobody tells her no. But nobody tells her no. Cool. Cool. Thank you. I have one more for you. Guess I can't pay my bills, guess I can't pay my rent Thought of running away, but I'm already spent When I come off the air, it's gonna give me the bends When I come off the air, it's gonna give me the bends Guess I can't pay my bills, guess I can't pay my rent Thought of running away, but I'm already spent When I come off the air, it's gonna give me the bends When I come off the air, it's gonna give me the bends They say, why don't you spend your time wisely? Yeah. Why don't you spend your time wisely? Dream with both eyes open time wisely. Yeah. Why don't you spend your time wisely? Yeah, yeah. Dream with both eyes open. Who could have predicted this type of outcome? And all I see is rather like some Malcolm. Thought that I needed friends, I'm good without some. Congrats, you made it, and it's only round one. I'm on the first thing, shipping out to last place. Last half looking like a drag race. Laugh now, life will leave a bad taste. And you just gotta take it with a smile. Them corners dusted off of me, I know it's been a while. Can't believe. You haven't seen me since a little child But now I'm, now I'm grown up Pockets never show much Whiskey in my system Got a buddy feeling so tough I'm disgusting by my image No amount of hating You can wipe away the blemish oh. And if I drown, don't let me finish But even silver line has got a scrimmage I can't pay my bills, guess I can't pay my rent Thought of running away, but I'm already spent When I come off the air, it's gonna give me the pens When I come off the air, it's gonna give me the pens Guess I can't pay my bills, guess I can't pay my rent Thought of running away, but I'm already spent When I come off the air, it's gonna give me the pens When I come off the air, it's gonna give me the pens
hands. Thank you all so much. I'm Wooly. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite Hyler Talley and David Barba to come to the stage. So Hyler and David are two local visual artists, and they're both responsible for the displays you are seeing here tonight to my left and to my right. And they're going to tell you a little bit about some of this artwork. And we'll start with Hyler. So Hyler, you've got the beautiful artwork over here. Let, tell us a little bit about that. Hello, I'm Hyler Talley, and I'm a trained painter, but I love printmaking, and I love collage. And that's what you will see um, in my work there. I make a lot of things. <laughs> so um, a lot of that stuff I've made for... Um, I participated in a, a um, fair in Fort Worth, Texas. It's a really large um, art fair that they do annually. And I made those pieces for that fair. Um, I am drawn to things that are old. I'm very nostalgic. And a lot of those things are images that I thought were quite striking. And I kind of put them together. Um, to tell a different type of story. So I find old photographs, um, anything old that I think that would accentuate or make a cohesive story, I put it together and hopefully make you laugh. I even use um, old books like that I find in the thrift store and cut up the words to make a, st a sentence or a statement. So that's what you'll see when you look at the things there. And I know that if anyone hasn't checked out Hyler's gallery downtown, the art factory in the Millwork District, it's absolutely incredible. She's a very, very talented artist. Tell us a little bit about some of the work that's available there as well. Well, there's nothing in the gallery right now. I, I just selfishly purposed the month of February for myself. <laughs> so it's empty and it's locked, sorry. <laughs> But usually what you can see down there, a lot of very large scale works. Hyler loves to work with a lot of color um, and a lot of very vibrant work. So yeah, she's saying, look at her dress. Hyler's all about color. So um, all of these pieces are available for sale tonight. So if you like a piece that you see, it's a wonderful opportunity to support local artists that are right here tonight. If you have any questions throughout the evening, they'll both be available too after the panel discussion to tell you a little bit more about their work. So thank you very much, Hyler. And next, I would like to introduce David Barba. 
Yes, big round of applause for Hyler. So David is another local artist that I just had the pleasure of meeting, gosh, about two weeks ago. Um, and right away, I was just enamored with his work. His work can be seen on this side of the auditorium. So David, tell us a little bit about your work, what inspires you to create it, and some of the thought process behind these pieces we're seeing. Yeah. First of all, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to come here and talk about my artwork. Uh, my name is David Barba. I'm a painter, illustrator, and uh, the director of the Dubuque Area Arts Collective, a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we curate arts events that focus on the development and recruitment of young artists, and our decision to emphasize our engagement with new artists and empowering them to pursue their craft has built a community that is welcoming to all, all kinds of people, uh, but also inspires personal and professional growth in our participants. Uh, for me, art is about learning from one another. Uh, whether you write a song, perform a poem, or paint a painting, it provides an insight into the life experience of someone who might be very different from you. And for me, that's the best part. Uh, if you build a community that celebrates arts and culture, not only do you build a community that celebrates our differences, but you can actually learn in what ways uh, we have more in common than with one another than you might think. Um, so why should you care about my paintings? Uh, to be fair, I'm still trying to figure that out myself. Uh, simply put, I'm a portrait artist. I love people. Uh, my work has been a process of researching the lives of these people uh, that inspire me. I believe everyone has amazing things they can teach the world. Everyone has valuable lessons and wisdom to bring to us. And if I can be a messenger for that, I'm happy. Uh, what I've learned is that these people People like Marsha P. Johnson, a drag queen from New Jersey, or Jermaine Cole, a rapper from North Carolina, who on the surface seem to have nothing in common with this white kid from the suburbs. Uh, they actually share a lot of the same emotions that I have, and their perseverance to overcome their obstacles in their lives inspire me to do the same with mine. Uh, so I'll leave on this. Um, is, if someone is said to be so different from you, Learn from them. The similarities might surprise you. And art is just an attention-getting device for that. I believe it's the key to build a society that values our diversity rather than one that uses it to further isolate one another into our social bubbles, which I'm sure we might all be familiar with. Um, so thank you for, for liking my artwork, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much, David. We appreciate it. So we are going to go ahead and get underway in just a few minutes here. So gather your drinks, gather your food, begin making your way to the tables and the seats, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.
just this room. What you like that? Okay, if everyone could say, take their seats, we're going to get started in just one minute. William and Trilligator, this means you. <laughs> Not afraid to call somebody out. Hey, if you, if you uh, are having any difficulty hearing at all, uh, these front seats are great, so feel free to move up to one of the front tables. Join some other folks who might not have a full table yet. Grab one of the front seats. We'll start in about one minute here. Or less. Or less. Rick? All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. My name is Bob Woodward. I'm the Vice President of Community Media for Woodward Communications, publisher of TH Media, and we really appreciate everyone's attendance tonight in this fourth or fifth in a series of seven. Number five, we're up to number five already. And um, this has been one of the best crowds yet. No surprise to me and some others, it's a pretty artistic community. After Food and water and sleep and shelter, some of the basic, you know, hierarchy of needs stuff. Safety, transportation, a job, make a, some gainful employment. 
The next really most important thing after that is a sense of belonging. And to know that you are welcome, to know that you are valued, to know that you have friends. Arts and culture plays a really important part in that whole process. It's how we express ourselves. It's how we celebrate ourselves. It's how we celebrate our culture. It's how we express our creativity, our history, our experiences, and so on. And, and that's why it's so important, and that's why I think Dubuque values it so much. But we can do more, and we can do better. We're going to talk about that tonight. The activities that you participate in can make or break your experience in the community. It can make the decision of whether you stay or whether you leave and whether you enjoy your life in the community. And we want to be one of those communities where people come and stay and love it. So arts and culture is not just, there's hardware and software in this world, right? Hardware may, might be the buildings and the spaces that we use. The software is the programming. The software is what happens in those spaces. And so that's a little bit about what we want to talk about tonight. And are we making those spaces intentionally welcoming? Are we opening up to the diverse voices and faces? Are we making those events accessible and affordable? as possible. How can we do better in those areas? We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. So we're going to explore some of those in detail. Here's the agenda for this evening. We're going to start off with a welcome from our uh, keynote sponsor. I'll talk about that in a second. We're going to share a little bit of data from the Community Foundation and we're very happy that the Community Foundation is partnering with us in this whole series. And so I want to say thank you to Nancy Van Milligan and every Bobby and everybody at the Community Foundation. And there's some next steps to come that involve the foundation after tonight. Uh, we'll have, uh, after that, we'll have a panel discussion, and we're going to cover a lot of topics. We are not going to cover them all. I think we just need to accept that. We're going to try and, and get as many on the table as possible, but there's going to be more that needs to be said and done after we're done. So well, there'll be a Q&A. We want you to participate in that. I believe there are cards on the tables with... Uh, pens that you can write your questions down. We'll be collecting those and sharing them with the moderators who will pose those to the panel. Again, we won't get to them all. We'll get to them as many as we can. And then afterwards, we're going to have some follow-on conversations, and that's where some of the real work is going to happen. Afterwards, as we talk here, and some of those next steps and um, action items that come later. So that's, those are our goals for tonight. I'm going to be taking notes here, and I'm going to give my report out on what I've heard at the end of the evening and some of those action items and next steps and hopefully you'll make some of your own as well. So I mentioned the Community Foundation, we want to thank them, but also we have a number of sponsors, seven of them in particular, who have been uh, involved in this whole series. Uh, Cottingham and Butler Insurance here in Dubuque, I'm going to name all seven, the Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce, John Deere, Green State Credit Union, Greater Dubuque Development, Northeast Iowa Community College, and Hodge Companies. We could not do this without their help. Please help me thank them. So our lead sponsor tonight, uh, probably no surprise, this is something that's near and dear to their heart as a company and also individually, and that's Cottingham and Butler and Andy Butler in particular. Um, couldn't uh, say more, I think a lot of us know that uh, they've been longtime supporters of the arts and Andy and everybody in that company understands the important role it plays in their community. So here to share a few words with us to get us started tonight, please welcome Andy Butler. Thanks, Bob. Just so you know, Bob asked me to talk about <clears throat> excuse me. Bob asked me to talk about exclusion F on the property policy for 25 minutes. I, I'm not going to do that. Um, what I did want to do is share a few thoughts that I have about arts and culture and the, and the, and the power and importance that that has. Uh, for those of you that have ever done any traveling or have even just stayed in Dubuque, it should be very apparent that a strong arts orientation, a strong cultural orientation in a community really is the heartbeat of a strong, vibrant community. And if you don't have that, things start to deteriorate. And, uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough to travel around the world and the places that are most fascinating have a strong emphasis on arts and culture. And it doesn't matter where you're going. It could be Rickardville, Iowa. It could be Venice, Italy. Um, so keep that in mind today. The other thing 
that I'd like to share with you is that Dubuque has an incredibly powerful arts and culture orientation. And I would tell you that the creators and the makers of arts and culture have done more for diversity, equity, and inclusion in Dubuque than anywhere else I've ever seen. The disconnect is creating engagement and accessibility for people so that everybody feels like they can participate at a level that they're comfortable participating, whether it's outreach educational programs, whether it's getting people into buildings like this or like the art museum or the symphony or seeing shows at the Voices. That's where we need to really start focusing on <clears throat> becoming a stronger, more connected community. Um, I remember not, not, not all that long ago, and, and this is, a, again, a personal experience about the power of, in this case, it's art. Um, my wife and I were at a fundraiser for an art museum down in the Quad Cities, and like most fundraisers, they have speakers talk before they open the auction. And the purpose is to tug at our heartstrings, put a little tear in our eye, and I'm going, holy cow, this is art. How can that happen? Um, and I was shocked. There were two speakers that had a profound impact on me. One was the principal of the Rock Island Academy. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, Rock Island is probably the most economically challenged of the Quad Cities. And the principal was the speaker, short little woman, unbelievable speaker, unbelievably talented. She got up, she said, you know, it was middle of January. I was in my office doing some things. I heard this pounding on the door at 6 p.m. And she goes, what is it now? Because that's happened before and it was never good. Turns out it was a third grader who had dragged his mom back to school to go see the art that he had made with an instructor from the Figgy Museum. And so that activity of engaging a young mind, a young creative mind in the making of art had a huge impact on that child's life and his mother's life. It was so important that they both decided to go back and, and see that work that day that he had made it. The other thing that was even more poignant for me uh, was the county sheriff in Scott County. He got up and he started to talk about the educational outreach program that the Figgy had uh, in taking objects of art to, in this case, the juvenile detention center to try and engage these young kids uh, to change their trajectory. And he talked about one particular young man who was sitting in a corner, not engaged with anybody his entire stay at the, at the detention center. And when they started to talk about these particular objects, they were uh, masks from Africa, a light went off in this young man's head, in, in his eyes, and um, a month later, the sheriff went to the figgy and he said, what you did for this young man was amazing. All of a sudden, he found purpose in life. He started to go research his history, his heritage, where he came from. And that changed a life. And those stories don't get shared very often with people. But that's the power of art. That's the power of culture. And that's why it's so important that we get this right for our community so that we can be a concentric ring or the puddle in the pond to go help the rest of Iowa and the rest of the Midwest understand the important conversations we're having here today. So partake, participate. Um, I know public speaking can be really challenging and really difficult. Raise your hand if you have questions. If there's somebody at your table who is more outgoing than you are, raise their hand for you so that they can ask your questions. Write them down on the cards like Bob said. But enjoy the evening. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful event. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, Cottingham and Butler, for sponsoring the series and for tonight in particular. So to get us started and learn a little bit more about some of the data behind uh, the, the information be, uh, behind uh, some of the arts uh, and accessibility and so on, we turn to our friends at the Community Foundation, and tonight Jason Nysus is going to share a little bit about that background. Jason? Well, good evening, everyone. It's great to see so many uh, familiar faces and friendly faces out in the crowd today. Uh, I, I also want to express my appreciation for you all being here for this important discussion. Uh, what we're going to do tonight is part of a process that Bob kind of introduced how this is all going to play out across the course of the month. So today we're in the, the purple area. There up there we're starting our data collection process and we're having this uh, panel discussion to kick off the actual community conversations that are going to happen in neighborhoods and in arts facilities and all other kinds of places across uh, Dubuque over the next month. So those community conversations and simultaneously a community survey. 
that is, uh, you can fill it out in paper form or online to get more data about what's important to people in the arts, do they feel included, and what else can we do to be a more welcoming and inclusive community around arts and culture activities. Um, once the, the panel discussion, the data collection, the community conversations, and the survey are completed, there will be a snapshot then that's produced that kind of encapsulates all of the data we've collected and maps out some paths forward for uh, the rest of the uh, conversation. We're now in February for the arts and culture discussion. We still have March and April coming up. We have conversations on safe neighborhoods and transportation that will follow that same format, kicking off this way, community conversations, surveys, and then a snapshot. And then that'll all wrap up in May. So as we start off our conversation, um, I have been working with a lot of you and a lot of arts organizations for many years talking about how do we measure impact? How do we measure the impact of the arts? And it's notoriously difficult to quantify the impact that arts have on our hearts and our souls. So we have some data that introduces the idea of how, what can we measure, what can we look at? So this uh, first chart, and these charts are also over on the side of the room, so you can explore them and look at them more in more detail later if you'd like. This one shows the trajectory. Um, this is the number of arts, entertainment, and recreation establishments from 1978 up through 2020. So you can kind of see that it's definitely on an upward trajectory with some dips, uh, some valleys, and peaks along the way. But there's definitely an upward trend. Um, like Andy was saying, cultural vitality is often expressed in the community through how these organizations manifest themselves in our community. So it's good to see an upward trend. Uh, with, that, with that upward trend, however, year to year, there is a fair amount of volatility uh, that we see in how people participate and fund and support arts organizations. This chart shows the number of net jobs gained or lost in those same uh, facility, those same establishments. So you can see year to year there is quite a bit of change as we go through, uh, which uh, you know, certainly represents a lot of different uh, ideas about how do we fund the arts? What kinds of trends are there? That, uh, what kinds of large institutions may open or close? Um, and how are people being employed at those organizations? This chart shows um, the number of establishments, the paid employees, and the annual payroll. And the blue chart, or the blue bar is 2013. The orange one is 2020. So this shows the number of establishments between 2013 and 2020 did go down a bit. The number of paid employees concurrently also went down a bit, and the annual payroll, as far as what folks earn at those uh, who work or support those organizations, also uh, went down a little bit since 2013. This chart shows the uh, types of establishments that we have. And again, if you, there's more detail on the charts to the side, but just in brief, the, there's employer establishments, so establishments that are large enough to actually have employees and fund their, themselves that way. Those are the ones on the left. On the right is non-employer. So these are nonprofits that might not have paid staff, individual artists who don't have paid staff. They're not paying anybody to work with them. Uh, so employer and non-employer. The blue bar is from the previous equity profile, so 2015. The orange one is 2020, uh, which is the most recent data that we had. So you can see, so the top, the top bar is independent artists, writers, and performers. So you can see that the blue bar for the number of employers who fall into that category is only three. Like there's not that many independent writers and artists who employ others. Um, and the non-employer one is across the way. There's 154 in the previous profile up to 200 um, in 2020. So there was some growth there. The one down below, the second one in the middle is museums, historical sites, and similar institutions. Um, employer and then non-employer. So the number of ones that are employers are relatively small. You know, there aren't that many that are large enough to have employees. And that remained fairly steady, five and six uh, between the profiles. The non-employers are also pretty small and uh, at two in 20 uh, from the previous profile and three in the current one. The bottom bars represent performing arts companies. And again, the number of companies that actually employ people is relatively low. The number of nonprofits that operate mostly with volunteers 
um, and without paid employees is much larger, and that's represented there on the right. And also remaining pretty steady, like from 19 to 26, between uh, 2015 and 2020. So this one actually shows the, uh, this, is, this actually does show some equity issues on it. This one is a split between males and females who are employed in these arts and culture, arts, entertainment and recreation sectors. So the number of people employed, um, the previous equity profile is on the left from 2015. The current data, uh, the most current data we have is on the right. So the number of people employed um, remain pretty steady uh, between males and females on the previous equity profile from 2015, but you'll notice that um, from the current equity profile, many more females have entered into this work, so it's become much more skewed uh, uh, for females. But when you look at the overall median wages, which is what's represented in the bottom uh, set of charts, the overall median wage is kind of in purple, and then you can see that the male is blue and the orange is female. So like some of the other presentations we've had about equity in wages, these are skewed as well. And it really, it really shows up when you see um, between the current data, how many more women are employed, they're still making less money as a median wage than the males, the fewer number of males who are employed in, the, in that sector. So there's a lot of disparity there between men and women and the wages that they earn, especially in the arts. So we also wanted to set the stage a little bit for what we learned in 2015 at the uh, equity profile. This, this data came from the surveys that were taken, so both written and online surveys. So from that data, uh, about 80% of the respondents agreed that there are events and opportunities that celebrate cultural traditions in Dubuque. There's a lot that we can point to that celebrates that. 72% agreed that there were opportunities to learn about traditions or cultures different than their own. 65% agreed that Dubuque offers affordable arts events. And about 73% agreed that their cultural traditions and celebrations are accepted in the community. So these numbers are relatively high um, as far as how people see themselves represented in the arts from a, a, a statistical and data standpoint. This data, however, is from the conversations. So when we sat around tables like that uh, in 2015 and actually gathered respondents, the people uh, who might not have been statistically represented in the highest parts of the majority were able to express their opinions and feelings, and a lot of people did not feel that their own culture was being represented as adequately as the mainstream or majority culture. The opportunity to learn about cultures is limited other than the library, multicultural family center, and the colleges. Um, I think I don't want to overlook the fact that our universities are a large part of the diversity that we have in our community and also very represented in the arts community here as well. There is a lack of diversity in the audiences and crowds at many arts events. And back in 2015, uh, after the previous equity profile, we really dug in on this. Uh, we created some uh, wor uh, um, working groups that really worked with a lot of the cultural organizations in Dubuque to understand that, and collecting data about um, audiences and uh, attendees at, uh, at uh, lots of events is very difficult and challenging, but I think most of us would agree that we see lots of disparities in that, uh, in, especially in, in this is all 2015 data. The arts and culture um, in Dubuque ref reflects one specific demographic. There is not diversity in the types of events that are offered. Uh, the final observation from the community conversations is that the Multicultural Family Center offers a lot of cultural learning opportunities, but outside of that organization, there are few opportunities to learn about different cultures. So again, this is what we uh, captured in 2015. I'm interested, of course, to hear the panel's discussion about this to see how, where have we come, like how far have we come since 2015 where we gathered this data, and of course, what are we going to learn in the upcoming community conversations? Where are we compared to how people were feeling about this in 2015? So that's the, uh, that's the data that we have to present and kind of sets the stage. Um, Alex Baum, in our office is the person who compiled the data, and he would be your main contact too if you want to dig in on any of the data that was collected, where did it come from, and to
uh, learn more about how we can measure the impact of the arts in our community. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. I, too, am interested to hear a little bit more from our panel today. So let's go ahead and bring them up. We'll go ahead and have all the panelists grab some seats. We'll get this thing off. Spread the uh, chairs out a little bit. We've got uh, three aside with uh, microphones. And we've got two incredible uh, facilitators tonight. So we have uh, from TH Media, we have Megan Gloss, who's going to be one of our facilitators. And the other one is going to be Alonda Gregory. So while they get set up, we'll get them and they'll introduce themselves. So please welcome to the stage. Hello? Oh. All right, we'll work on this mic here. And we'll get underway here. Thank you, everybody, for being so patient. My name is Megan Gloss. I'm the features editor at the Telegraph Herald. A large heart of what we cover uh, under that umbrella is arts and culture. So this is a, a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. And I'm happy to be here moderating tonight on among some of my very favorite sources and friends that I've known from very many years. And Alonda Gregory, please introduce yourself as well. Alonda Gregory with uh, Tri Phoenix Group. And I am happy to be here. I'm a Chicago native. I've been here 10 years this year. And my first community was the arts and culture community. That's my happy space. So thank you all again for being here. Thank you, guys. Jump right in, um, because I know we've got a lot to cover and a lot to unpack in a very short amount of time. So we took a look at that 2015 community conversation talking about arts and equity. When we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, obviously we're talking about a really wide scope there. We're talking about um, integra integrating different cultural backgrounds, different races, different ethnicities, different genders, uh, the LGBTQ plus community. So there's a lot there. Um, when it comes to the challenges your organization organizations are currently facing, what do those look like? And we can go ahead and start maybe with William and Trilligator down there and just kind of work our way down the line here, and I'll open it up to everybody. Thank you, Megan. Good evening, everybody. Um, the Dubuque Symphony Orchestra has been um, focused on trying to engage different parts of our community as well as um, representing different um, kinds of, um, I guess, backgrounds, ethnicities, cultures, nationalities, genders um, in our programming. Um, and we've had a concerted effort also to um, develop a task force around diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, where we look at um, everything from the kind of language we use in our forms to the type of makeup of our board of directors, the type of makeup of our musicians on stage, our guest artists. Um, and so we have a number of initiatives that we've had um, over the years to, like I said, engage different communities, re uh, represent underrepresented groups. Um, I could go on in specifics. I'm not sure how much detail you want at this point. No, I think that's really good. I think that gives us kind of an idea about some of the different challenges that the symphony is currently facing. Yeah. So, uh, Hyler, how about yourself? And Hyler's a new artist to our community. You've been here for about two years now. It's two years. For, and this from the month. Twin Cities. So, yeah. <laughs> so, and she has a wonderful gallery downtown called the Art Factory. Uh -huh. So, Hyler, tell us, I guess, a little bit about, you know, what, what your viewpoint is and some of the challenges, I guess, you're facing as a new gallery owner and what that space has been like for you. I'm sorry. I didn't catch the last bit. I'm the, the the echo in here is bad. <laughs> I apologize. I'm sorry, Megan. Yeah, just some of the different challenges maybe that you're facing as a new gallery owner and, and what that looks like for you, first impression has been like. Okay, so, I mean, it, I've lived a lot of places in the country, and I don't mind small towns. I, I It doesn't bother me, the population size. So um, coming here, I thought, for sure, I could open a gallery, you know, it's, it was feasible for me to do it. And it's been, it's been great. I've met so many people here that practice art, that sing, that dance, that there's a lot of different expressions of art here. So that, this, it's great, you know, I haven't had, 
I don't think there's really been any obstacles. I do wish that the people will, were willing, more willing to attend things. I feel like it, I feel like there's opportunities here, but I don't necessarily feel like people are willing to come, you know? <laughs> so the doors are open, but sometimes they're not well attended. So I would say there's, I don't know how you get that. <laughs> I don't know how that's attained or how you push that, but I think that there are people here that are willing to, to try to engage more people. Wonderful. Before we go any further, can we get everyone to introduce themselves? We know you. Yes. Everybody yes. Will else may not know you. So you want to introduce yourselves before we go any further? Sure. Well, yeah. Um, my name is William Intrilligator. I'm originally from Southern California, but at, for 23 years I've been the music director and conductor of the Dubuque Symphony Orchestra. I, did, I just met William now, just like a second ago, and I didn't know he was from Southern California. I'm from Southern California as well. So I, I have, like I said, I've moved a lot over, over the years, and um, I've just been here for a couple of years, and I have an art gallery in the Millwork District. My name is Hyler Talley. My name's Gary Stoppelman. I'm the executive director of the Dubuque Museum of Art, and I moved here from southern New England. <laughs> I, too, have lived across uh, many places, and I moved about the same time as Hyler. Uh, I, this is 20, where are we, 23? I'm not much. Yeah, I moved at the end of 2020. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gene Tully. And I am the president of Voices Productions. I'm also a businessman, a metal sculptor, and a really, really proud grandfather. I mean, <laughs> those kids are the best. Which I say in particular because we are building a community for my grandkids. All right, you are doing that, and I thank you all for your efforts for doing that because they're so lovely, and they're so talented, and they're so open, and you people are influencing them every day. So thank you for that. Hello, I am Jenny Peterson Brandt. I am the Arts and Cultural Affairs Manager for the city of Dubuque. I'm also a working artist. I'm a potter and have a studio in my basement where I like to throw pots. Um, and I also like to share that I am a, a Dubuque boomeranger, as people like to talk about. So I grew up in the area, um, left for undergrad, further away for graduate school, and moved back um, three and a half years ago to take this job with the city of Dubuque. And every day, proud to be part of the arts and cultural community here in this community. So that's Jenny. Me. Jenny. What, Gary? Is ceramics the only media you work in? No. I'm also a snow sculptor, and I'll be sculpting snow this week. So. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. And I also do mosaics and printmaking, so, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm new to the art of snow sculpting. So, Good evening. My name is Nick Holder. I'm the executive and artistic director at the Grand Opera House, just spending just about two years down there, but have been in Dubuque oh, since... 2005 as a college student and then coming back to make Dubuque my home once I finished um, graduate school. So uh, proud to be a part of the long history of arts and culture here in Dubuque. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. So I'll open it back up once more. I think we left off with Gary Stoppelman uh, talking about challenges that face organizations. So looking at the makeup of the Dubuque Museum of Art, what are some things that you're currently facing and what are you doing to, to I guess, undergo those challenges? Well, thank you, Megan. Thank you to the Community Foundation and to the Telegraph Herald and to all of you and to Steeple Square for being here for this important conversation. Um, I would describe the challenges that the museum faces, well, first of all, as not unique to our organization, to our city, um, and not challenges that the museum is going to solve on its own. 
I think we face some universal challenges. I would describe them perhaps best and most simply as Newton's first law. The challenge that the museum faces, I believe, is that 2024 will be our 150th, all right? We are the first cultural organization in the city where Iowa began. And so why do I reference Newton's law? Because Newton's law states that bodies at rest tend to stay at rest unless acted upon by external forces greater than, than those bodies. And I think Jason shared with us some of what those external forces look like. Uh, and that is demographics. And the future is here. The future is in this room. Gene just pointed it out. The future of our community looks very different than the future of our past. And if we want to be engaged and meaningfully engaged in the future of this city, then we are going to have to engage and meaningfully engage with audiences, artists, diverse members of our community that we have historically not built relationships with. And so I would articulate that the challenge that we face is building the capacity to overcome our own inertia, to build change for ourselves uh, so that um, we are building relationships with the audiences of the future. Yeah, thank you. Gene, how about voices? Would you repeat the question? So different, different obstacles or challenges that your organization is facing, speaking on behalf of Voices Productions. Obstacles, you know, I don't see a lot of them, um, to be truthful, you know. Um, we put together 60 murals in this town to be totally democratic about art. I don't see obstacles other than a few people who would protest one way or the other about painting this or that. Um, but I think in the past five years, we've shared so much art with people in the most democratic manner that is possible. And uh, I feel real good about that. So at this point, I don't see a lot of obstacles. When we were doing the warehouse shows, it's like Hyler said, the doors were open. The doors were open and people choose to come out and, and to be there, um, whether or not it's, it's subject matter. But I think we all have a responsibility to encourage people to go out. I've got two mentors that are sitting right here up here in the front row, Fran and Ellen Henkels, that showed me how to do art. And sometimes I curse them for that because it's taking such a big part of my life and it's a wonderful, wonderful part. But it's, that's what it takes. That's what it takes is to reach out and show people how to do it. I think the obstacles, if there are obstacles, those are the, old, the impressions, the biases that we have in our own mind that I don't belong here or I don't belong there or I can't go through here. These are things that are instilled in us one way or the other, but it takes people like this to break that down. So each of you then has the opportunity to be that mentor, to go out there, encourage and say, I know the way in here and I'll show you and I'll introduce you around and I'll, I'll show you how to volunteer. So if there's an obstacle, it's not enough people like Fran and Ellen Hankos that are out there doing the work of sharing the art and sharing the love and sharing this community. Jenny really has her finger on the pulse of the broader scope of the city of Dubuque and in terms of arts and culture. And she kind of got a crash course in that during the COVID-19 pandemic. I think that was your first year here. So in terms of just challenges you've seen, um, not even factoring in the, in the pandemic, but when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how you're trying to broader that communication and that encouragement of those kinds of, of projects on, on the larger scale, what are some things you're noticing, Jenny? 
So I, some of the things that I want to speak to are, are really are not speaking to the city of Dubuque or Office of Arts and Culture. They're really just a, a broad perspective, sort of observations that I have from, from the place that I sit in my role at the city. Um, I will say that I think when it comes to arts and culture and I think just community in general and where we are at, especially post-pandemic, um, I want to acknowledge that there is a huge competition for resources and a huge competition for people's time. So, um, you know, when we're thinking about all of those places where we need to put investment and we need to have clothes on people's backs and we need to have food on their tables and roofs over their heads, sometimes arts and culture doesn't have the investment that it needs to have the capacity that it needs to do the work that it wants to do. So that I think is a huge thing when it comes to arts and culture. Um, I also will say that I, I think in terms of, I will also add to kind of what Gary was saying, I think sometimes we can get stuck in the ways that we've always done things and we go to the things that we've always gone to and um, we can get sort of complacent and we can get, we don't want to try something new. We don't want to go to the thing that we don't know if we're going to have fun. We don't know if our friends are going to show up with us. We don't, you know, we don't know if it's going to be worth our, you know, maybe $15 ticket that we paid to go to a show at the Grand, like 15 bucks, like anything's worth 15 bucks. Like just go to the show, you know, try it out. I think, I think we, you know, we, and, and that might be a bit of a Midwestern sort of perspective as well. Like, I don't know if Midwesterners, if we're really good at trying new things. So that's kind of my challenge to this audience is to try new things, to show up in the spaces that you haven't shown up at before and, and just be there and to be present. Um, and I think the last thing I just want to go back to is, is that capacity thing. When we looked at that data that was on, um, that was shown, how many of the organizations that we have in this community that are putting on really strong events are all volunteer run? They don't have paid staff. So the expectations of what they can do, you know, we, you know, they, great to be remain volunteer but then they need the volunteers that are there with the passion and the time and willing to put forward the resources to make new cool things happen that have diverse voices at the table so that's just some of the challenges that I see no that's great and Nick Holler speaking to the Grand Opera House what are some of the different challenges that you're noticing there in, in terms of live theater I would say it's similar to what Gary and, and Jenny have already touched on in terms of what we're facing here at the Grand. Um, one, I'm from a smaller town in Northwest Iowa, so it still surprises me in my short time at the Grand how many Dubuque residents don't even know that the Grand Opera House exists, which is a 130-year-old building um, that m my you know, community theater that I oversee on a day-to-day -day basis happens to reside in. So one, they don't know the building exists, let alone probably then the organization and the art that is created in the building. So that's one struggle that we have, that I've kind of addressed in my time there is um, having a, a broader community awareness of, of who we are, where we're at. And I know some of that means that we need to get outside of our own great four walls of that historic building, which then goes back to the capacity issue that even though we do have paid staff members as part of our organization, it's for when we're fully staffed and for people to do everything that we have to do just on a day-to-day -day basis is enough. So we're, we're kind of already stretched to our limits and so in some cases it's hard to advance your organizational mission and, and the programming that you want to do because you're working within the resources and we do rely so heavily, as Jenny points out, on then a volunteer base because much like so many organizations, we're an organization in, by, and for the community. And if it wasn't for our volunteer base, working alongside of the artists that we do contract for our various productions, we're not able to do what we do, let alone then have people come and support their fellow community members who have put on the various different events that we have here. So those are kind of the, the struggles that we face right now. Thank you, Nick. All right, ready for the next question. You all kind of elaborated a little bit on this. What is your organization doing to meet those challenges to provide an equitable experience to both artists, artists and audiences? You want me to start? And this can just be open to anybody yeah. that you just raise your hand and we'll come around with a microphone to you. Um, 
Well, the Dubuque Symphony Orchestra, uh, like this past weekend, for instance, we had an all Latin American music program reaching out to the Latino community um, here, and uh, we partnered with a number of other organizations to do that. Um, that's one example. We, we've tried to engage different aspects of our community in programming like that. We've tried to um, be really rigorous about the blind audition process for members of the orchestra so that um, there, there's no discrimination in it of any kind. It's, it's a total meritocracy. Um, but we're also trying to be more proactive in trying to encourage uh, underrepresented groups to audition to be in the orchestra. And, um, and just a few years ago, we had a number of more people um, audition and win positions like that. So that was good. Um, I mentioned earlier some of the things that we're doing with our um, Dubuque Symphony Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Task Force. Um, and a lot of it does come down to, in the public side to the programming. Um, there is you know, a wealth of great music out there by so many different um, types of composers and, and artists, and there are so many great performers. Um, and so we're, we're trying to change the way that the symphony kind of looks on stage and the kind of music that we're performing, you know, with a very strong belief that music is universal and can touch everyone. Um, and, um, and so we have, you know, guest artists of color, um, different kinds of styles, different unusual kinds of instruments featured to, um, we, we had a transgender, uh, uh, individual perform a piano concerto. Um, there, there's been a lot of different uh, efforts in that uh, in that area while maintaining the um, artistic excellence that is so important for the Dubuque Symphony. So those are some of the things that we're doing. But we still have the, some of the challenges that some of my friends and colleagues here had mentioned in terms of getting people to come in, um, um, meeting them where they're at instead of um, just sort of doing it just sort of as a token kind of thing. Um, and seeing what the real need is. Um, and I think one of the things that I think a lot of our organizations focus also on is education. And so, um, for instance, when the Dubuque Symphony Orchestra has free concerts for every third grader and fifth grader, there's, you know, they're, they're of all kinds of people there. Um, and I, I think that's a really important aspect of this, of this too. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to share on that? So this I will speak from the um, Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs and some of the things that we're trying to do. Um, so in, in the thought of making programs more accessible um, and helping organizations to try new things um, that they might not be able to have the, the earned income from it, you know, like for them to sort of go out on a limb. Um, we do offer grant programs through the city of Dubuque. So we have an operating support program that is meant to fund a piece of established arts and culture nonprofits organizations, their budgets. So, you know, if, if we're maybe providing some funding to help keep their lights on and pay some staff, then they can have a lower ticket price. Um, we also have special projects funding so that if they have a new great idea and those new great ideas when that grant program goes out there always has to be a DEI component to the proposal that they put forward. Um, if that's a, a project that they want to get off the ground, we, we have that grant program to potentially help fund that. And it's pretty substantial grants. It's you know up to $8,000 to get something new off the ground. Um, and then we're always trying to cultivate new resources. So we recently we received some funding from the Government Alliance on Race and Equity and created a new grant program that was very specific to um, supporting new projects by organizations that was about um, activities that they wanted to do with BIPOC artists and to help elevate the, the voices of BIPOC, BIPOC artists within our community and within their organization. So that's, that's something from the city side of things that we're trying to do. I just want Jenny to tell people where they can go to find this. Oh, the things that I'm talking about? Yes. Um, go to the, the www.cityofdubuque.org slash arts and culture, and you'll find out about all the things I'm talking about. <laughs> this came up at a board meeting last two weeks ago. Does everyone in here know what BIPOC is? 
Does anyone not know what BIPOC is? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. That's why we're here. Would somebody like to provide a definition? Black, indigenous, people of color. Right? So that's, that's I just wanted, like, <laughs> let's, get, let's get the conversation going. In that, in that spirit, I want to build on something that William said. Uh, why, is, why is working with the schools really important? When we talk about changing inertia, and I said, the future is here. Do you know what the uh, self-identified white, non-Hispanic population of the Dubuque Community Schools is? It's 75.9%. Do you know what the white, non-Hispanic population of the United States is? It's 75.8%. The Dubuque Community Schools looks like the rest of the country. So if we want to be, and that's what I mean by when I say, when I say if, we want to look, if we want to be engaged in building the community of the future and attracting the workforce of the future, we need to be dealing with we need to be building relationships with the communities that are here today and not only with those that we've historically built relationships with. So I, I sort of wanted to take that as an opportunity to, to bring some community foundation data in. This data message brought to you by. Um, so what are we doing? Um, I think another place we could spend a second is maybe defining diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I think about diversity as a number, right? Do you have a multiplicity of perspectives in your community, in your organization? Equity means are people treated fairly? So he talked about the blind audition. When we look at equity, actually, we're looking at removing the blind audition because right when we've relied on the blind audition, we tend to not have showcase diverse voices. So we're actually looking at our rules and policies to see if we can be more intentional in what happens uh, and not only leave it up to just choosing the same group that we've always chosen. Inclusion is something very different. And it gets to the heart of what William was saying. Inclusion is the intentional and ongoing effort to ensure that diverse perspectives are participating, that was, I think, the word you used, are participating, at every level in the organization. So we spent 2020 and 2021 working on equity, looking at our foundational documents and making sure that they are guiding us towards the community impact, the community that we want to build. And so you can find our strategic plan at dbqr.org. And that's important, and it's important to have a North Star that's going to guide you towards the impact that you're trying to create. The inclusion part, as I said, is an intentional and ongoing process. So this spring, this winter, we launched an experiment that is the first in an intentional and ongoing process. And the experiment is what happens if we intentionally give over our space and include an artist, a BIPOC artist every year, at least once. And I'm ashamed to say, but that's why we're here, that that's, if we do it once a year, that's a major change for us. That show is up through Sunday. It's called Black Thread, and I encourage you all to come down and take a look. 
I also choose the word experiment very clearly because I want, I'm also going to tell you today that we're going to fail. There will be times when we'll mess up. And I'm going to ask everybody in this room to give us feedback. and Let us know with empathy uh, and help us learn and help us grow. And I think that, that creating spaces like this for feedback, like the Community as Foundation is doing to continue the conversation after we leave tonight, is really important. So, and we, you know, as Jason pointed out, the stories that get told depend on who we listen to, right? So uh, I encourage us to, to continue to show up, to support, uh, and to put ourselves into spaces where we are hearing different kinds of voices. Thank you for that. I think that pivots really nicely into the next set of questions we have, and that's a little bit about accessibility on a couple different fronts. So on one hand, accessibility when it comes to cost. What is your feelings in terms of prices, the various price points we have in the Dubuque community for price of the arts? And it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? I mean, we feel like we want to value that. We want to support artists in the community. We don't want to have it so high that it's not accessible for people to come, but we do have, you know, people that we need to pay, artists that we want to support. And also representation when it comes to, you know, fostering that new development of talent, finding space for those new voices, for diverse voices. Um, whoever would like to, I'll kind of open the floor, whoever would like to begin talking about, you know, first price point and then representation when it comes to some of these different spaces for artists. I'm sorry, because I'm reading. <laughs> sorry. Um, did, was that a question? That was the question, yeah. <laughs> Anyone can jump right in. Thank you. Like, please jump in. No, I'm sorry. I, had to, I got sidetracked. Squirrel, sorry. <laughs> it is tough to be able to um, make it so that tickets and the price of art um, and the experience of art or music uh, and theater and dance is affordable to all. That's um, something that I think many of us uh, have struggled with because um, it, it seems to me as though, you know, like when you see art in a gallery, um, it, it's, it's hard sometimes to come to terms with the fact that the artist might be getting relatively little for that work of art. Um, but there is a sort of a price point, you know, I think it's obviously it's important for uh, uh, tickets to be affordable to events like the Dubuque Symphony um, and others, and so we have a various you know pricing structures to make it affordable to try to reach out to um, you know we we try to you know have student tickets and and different kinds of price categories and such like that. In terms of the other aspect of your question, Megan, um, we're in ho in the hopes of trying to develop a fellowship. Uh, with the Dubuque Symphony where we'll have um, a, a young, younger musician sort of at that point in their career where they're out of conservatory but um, may, may not have won a big job with an orchestra um, and you know to really target the BIPOC community and to have that person be uh, sort of like a fellow in the orchestra performing with the orchestra for a period of two years and so we're, we're looking at to trying to start that in the next few years. We've put a lot of kind of initial work into that. Um, but it's tough with the, pri the pricing thing um, and uh, the access to like streaming entertainment and arts and stuff like that has not helped, you know, because uh, uh, it's great that that's there though, um, that there is more universal access to, to things of that nature. It's just harder for our organizations that do have to pay the bills and pay the salaries and, and you know, and so forth, yeah. There is one question that we got from audiences, and I want to remind everybody that we do have these cards in the middle of the table, so if you do have these, put them up nice and high so our room monitors can grab these from you so that we can fit in as many of these as possible in the short amount of time we have. But the question is, what other obstacles is there beyond price? You know, obviously price point is huge, representation is huge, but what, what are some of the other obstacles that people might have that might not get them in the door and not make them feel like they can participate? 
Um, so very quickly, I, I would encourage anybody who's interested in this price question and what are the other obstacles beyond price to look at the research done by Colleen Dillenschneider. Um, and Nick already answered this question, right? He charges $15 and most people don't know, right? There, is, there are reams and reams and reams of data that show that if you make yourself free, you increase attendance by the people who are already coming. It does not, there's reams of the same data shows over and over and over again, that if you make yourself free, the people who aren't coming don't suddenly flood your doors, right? I assume that's what's behind the question, what else besides price? Um, so I'll share a story. Um, Anderson Sancy is in the room tonight. Anderson is largely responsible for us all being here tonight. And um, we were having coffee a couple months ago. And I said, Anderson, Anderson's on our board. I said, Anderson, how do I get the Black Men's Coalition to become more regularly engaged at the museum? And he said, you know what? Straight up real talk. He said, you know what? For better or for worse right now, what we need to do is to showcase work made by black and brown hands, period. And yes, we want to make sure that people who have black and brown hands know that they're invited 365 days a year. Um, but it, you know, one of the conversations that we have at the museum often is, yeah, our doors are open. Why is no, you know, why aren't, it's one thing to have your doors open and it's another thing to invite people. And so price is an important tactic an important tool for, for organizations that are doing the hard work of making their programming accessible, their invitation welcoming, their policies equitable. But it is a blunt instrument that on its own doesn't do a whole lot. Um, beyond price, <clears throat> I was having a conversation in the back before we started here today and we were talking about making pies I mean, how many good pie makers do you know out there anymore? It doesn't take longer than, ooh, oh, I, I want your name. <laughs> it doesn't take very long to forget the power of lard to make a good pie crust, all right? So what are the obstacles beyond price? One word then, it's education. What are we putting into our education these days to teach children how to draw, how to weld, how to do these things? It's getting watered down every opportunity we have. More money for education equals more awareness for the arts and then more people that are going out and supporting the arts in our community. Yeah. And I just want to add on to Jean's comment because something that I, I just personally I feel that very much that's a big piece of it. It's the education. And it's not only just in the education of like teaching hands to do something or a body to perform something, but it's making it as important in their education so that it's a, it's a value system in our community. So if we are defunding the arts, if we are not putting that investment in that, um, we teach the rest of the community not to value it at the same time, and I think that's a big piece of it. Mm -hmm. I, I would also like to say that I think that all, a lot of these organizations can actually bridge, make a bridge if they go out into, like go out to where the people are and build the bridge. <laughs> like the symphony can go into the schools, the museum can take art to the schools. Um, the voices can promote art in the schools. Just by like just bringing the person they're featuring, even me, like bringing the person they're featuring into the space to, to kind of bridge or make it, make people aware of what's happening. So it's a small 
introduction to a large venue, okay? So it's building a bridge, you know, going out to where the people are, and then the people will come to your space. It's like inviting someone to your house. You go to their house, they come to your house. <laughs> That's great. Oh, go ahead. That, that we so, have found that to be true with the symphony too. So we've tried to get out of Five Flags Theater and perform in a number of different other spaces, um, whether it be Voices or the Mississippi Moon Bar or in the lobby of Connie Hammond Butler or in at the Arboretum. And you, you know, we've tried to go to different neighborhoods as well. Um, and that is so important because I think a lot of people, for, for a lot of people, even though it's price may not be a barrier, just going through the doors of Five Flags Theater seems to be some kind of barrier. Like they don't see it as a place for them, unfortunately. Um, and even though it's really is for everybody. Um, but like you said, if we go to them, maybe they'll come to our house next time. That's right, that's right. <laughs> I wanted to just add on to Hyler what you said. If the like, you, I'll invite you to my house, and you'll invite me to your house. You know, and vice versa. And so much of this work and growing this the um, the impact of arts and culture in our community, nuts and bolts comes down to the relationships and to the building the trust and these one on one. I mean, this is even tonight. I was so um, it was such a lovely space to come into tonight and how many people in like moving back here in three and a half years bit of time to have all of these people who I feel, you know, like we share a hug and it's a hello and it's a how are you doing? And that that is so important in this space um, for all of these organizations, the work that they do and all that we're doing individually within arts and culture to be focusing on those relationships and that trust building and continuing that moving forward. Do you want to Sure. Well, and I, well, no, I would just say, I mean, not once again being a, a Dubuque -er and coming to Dubuque, the great thing about it is all that it has going on. And I think that's one of the things that I think we all struggle with now is trying, we're all competing for people's time and therefore dollars and, and building those relationships and hopefully maintaining them um, is what's going to help uh, bridge that gap um, among those other things. Like I said, I know one thing that, that is uh, near and dear to me in terms of the work that we're going to be doing, you know, hopefully in the grand here going forward, is to get outside of those four walls once again. Um, we obviously have to worry about those four walls, but, but um, there may be issues with people having um, a stigma of, of that, that the grand isn't a place that they can be a part of. My door is always open, and, we, and I love seeing familiar faces, but as I always say, I love seeing new faces as well, and hopefully the new faces become um, the familiar faces going forward, um, because those people are once again so vital to the work um, that we do and, and our larger success for the Dubuque community. Thank you. There is an art to networking. Wherever you go to these places in the first Fridays, introduce yourself. There are people looking for you. Uh, so I just want to just add that in there too. There's an art to networking, so that's an art. So here's a question from the audience. Let's look at the age of the people in attendance here. How can we expand interest in the youth? Uh, what's the role, we kind of just spoke on the role of art education, and in part of that, how can we encourage more of it for the youth? How can we encourage them to participate? I'll answer for you if you want <laughs> William, <laughs> when you do concerts for young people, are they the same content as when you do concerts for old people? Um, yeah, I mean, we have a number of different programs for, you know, we, we hope to do even more, but we have a number of programs for different grade levels that's tailored to like what they're studying. But you're right, like there's, you know, maybe it would be great if we great if we had more younger people here tonight, um, uh, you know, and, and people interested in this conversation even as well. Um, you know, it, it's hard. And traditionally, you know, symphony audiences tend to skew on the older side. Um, we're, you know, trying to change that and we're trying to do everything we can with education, knowing that we, we can do more and we want to try to do even more. Um, but yeah, um, it's, 
it's important to have those different kind of age levels also represented when we're talking about diversity too. I think also building off of what Jean and Jenny said earlier in terms of the value of education, um, the idea that in our public schools, the focus shouldn't just purely be on STEM, that we need to add the A to it as well and it becomes STEAM. And we as organizations in the community can help reinforce what's going on in the schools, um, specific to theater, and, and it's true of all of the art forms, but you know, in theater we teach life skills that are just so happen to take form in a given production, but once that production's over, those skills don't go away. So to have the larger audience and larger community, I guess, see the value in what all of the skill sets that we do teach in our, in our chosen disciplines and how those can be applicable, just not in theater or the fine arts or whatever it is, that those are broad life skills that, that hopefully, one, make everyone um, a more well-rounded individual going forward, but there are actual tangible things there besides just the art that we might create. So those things live past um, some of these things that just last for a moment. Can I go ahead and, and so um, I think the museum is trying to do what I think the, the symphony orchestra already does with the programs it does for schools or the kinds of performances that it puts on at the Mississippi Moon Bar. Uh, and that is to look at, yeah, it's, uh, don't get me wrong, education's important, funding for schools is important, but we have a responsibility too. One of the most foundational, fundamental experiences that I ever had was I was, I was then working at the Art Institute of Chicago and we had put on a Magritte exhibition and we thought that was the coolest thing ever. It was beautiful. It was Magritte, it was cool, it was theatrically lit, it was surreal, man. And for every exhibition, we worked with the Southside Chamber of Commerce and they brought in uh, whatever group they wanted to bring in. And for Magritte, it happened to be high school students. And the students went, had a private viewing and with just them and Magritte and they spent five minutes in Magritte. And they came out and they said, where's the contemporary art? And the lesson there is, goes back to this, language, this word we've been using a lot about, is it for me? Do I see myself there, right? So yes, education and top down is really important for all the reasons that Gene enumerated, but there's a reason why Gene puts art on buildings, right? There's a reason why he's using murals as a medium. Um, and you're gonna see more, and there's a reason why when the museum builds a new museum, you're gonna see us focused on new kinds of technology and new scale and dealing with the mediums that beyond, in addition to the traditional mediums, right? The artists working today, the composers working today, the performers working today, aren't only playing instruments from the 19th century. I'll just add one last comment that I think we need to pay attention to the things that um, small grassroots organizations are doing right now or individuals are doing. Um, there's some great things. Um, Christina Castaneda, are you still here somewhere? Um, the readings under the influence events that are happening that are drawing some younger audiences, the exhibitions that the Dubuque Area Arts Collective are putting on um, at Esther's, the, the events that the Smokestack does, like just I think paying attention to those things that are bubbling up that like young people are creating and then going back to the idea to like show up, support them, go to those things, show them that you care, be in that space and create that energy for them to want to continue doing that work and to continue putting more things on. And I would like to add something right quick. The art at the library, any artist in here, you can submit your work to the art of a library because they have an exhibition every other month, right? So start submitting your work, it's a waiting list, but do that. 
All right, we're already down to about five minutes, so we could probably go on for another six hours here. I know, there's a lot to unpack. Um, really quickly, we did have a question from the audience, what is First Fridays? So is there anybody that can kind of, for people that are unfamiliar what that is, what that encapsulates, who wants to give their best elevator speech on that? Who's been here longer? You know, in so many communities around here, those, uh, there's a celebration of art in uh, um, once a month, and we have that going on here in Dubuque, Iowa as well. Uh, first Friday of every month, galleries and, and uh, our studios are open. Um, I think that's going to expand. I think with the help of Henry Matheson and the Scenic Art Loop people, that that's going to be more pronounced. Um, we're hoping that when we open up a Voices Studios up on Central Avenue, that that will be a place to come and celebrate the arts. But getting out there and supporting, like, like Jenny just said, is so very important. And we have the opportunity to do that every first Friday. Now, I see this guy over here nodding his head. His name's Wes Heitzman. And you know Wes has been cultivating collectors with the um, plein air show and painting that has gone on here. So how do we affect youth? This is a little divergent for the how do we affect youth? Give art for a gift. You know, we are all, all collectors. I see you all collectors out here. So start giving it a gift to your grandkids, your children, whatever. It's going to really support art around here. If you just go out and buy something and say, hey, this is going to be a gift forever. Children learn what they live. Let them live with original art. So we've had so much to unpack here. The biggest question I really want to make sure that we address is what can the community do? How can we help? What are some ways we can step up as artists, as patrons of the arts, as supporters of the arts, as people just aware that the arts exist in their community? What is it that your orga organization needs from the community in order to succeed moving forward? Money. <laughs> Money. Buy art. <laughs> support the theater, support the symphony, support yeah. the museum, purchase. And I'll add to that, I think um, don't ask artists to do things for free because you just think that you, they love to do what they love to do. Um, if you're going to have a photographer come to your event, Find out how much they charge and pay them for their work. If, I mean, that's, those are the simple things. Don't Ask, don't ask musicians to play for free and don't offer them 50 bucks for a four hour gig. Ask them what they actually charge and find out how to support them. Okay, one more question. All right, this is from the audience. And how can we better define arts and culture to include more and help people understand it is more than music and painting? Um, I know my husband, he's an art audio engineer. Dale's over there, he does videography. What is, that's defining the arts and culture. This is the, the money question right here. I think I posed this question last year saying, what is art? Yes. And everybody kind of looked at me like, what? <laughs> so what is arts and culture? What I'm does that encapsulate? I'm not sure that it's different than what Jenny was just saying, right? I mean, the answer is go. The answer is give it. The answer is share it. Um, celebrate it. Uh, let us know when we put on some weird show of video art. Give it a shot. Um, I'm, yeah, do. Would another maybe definition be um, something that it inspires? I mean, I know, but that's, I don't know. I guess what we're saying is when you don't have to put on a suit and tie to go and do it. Creative professional maybe, maybe is that maybe more of an arts and culture? Is that a definition? I don't know what the, def what the definition is. I feel like it can be worked out through the doing, <laughs> we can come to a consensus at some point. You don't, I don't know if you have to know what it is when it's being done, but I wanted to also say that um, I think it's important that if people have ideas that they share it with people that have the building. <laughs> so you can 
because I feel like that's more expansive and things can be seen. If you have an idea, take it to the people that have the, the avenue in which to feature the idea. And that is a broader definition of art and inclusion. And, you know, when people can see the thing that you're doing in a, in a place like the Opera House or the Dubuque Museum or the Symphony, I think it's important to share your ideas, talk to the people that can possibly make your idea re real. One more question I want to throw in just because I, I know we have, we got a whole stack of questions from the audience we weren't able to get to, but there was a running theme in a lot of these about younger artists, artists of color, for those that do feel marginalized, that feel like they don't have a space, how do they get involved? What, what do they need to do beyond just saying you need to go network? What are just some piece of, pieces of advice you would give to them in terms of how, they, how this can be more, uh, they can see themselves more regularly represented rather than just once a year, where it's, it's really ingrained in the culture of arts and culture in Dubuque? You know, it's no secret that Dubuque is a little bit clicky. We're in silos. So it's hard to reach out to other cultures, getting to meet other people. However, organizations like this and the people that I see here can be that conduit for you. One of them, David Barba. Talk to David about how he, you can get involved in art. Another one, Brianna Thompson. Talk to Brianna. She's so energetic and ready to go. These are the people that are going to be the conduits. And if you know us, know other people that we can do that, add those names to the list. David and Brianna are going to be the movers and shakers in this next art millennium here. I couldn't agree more. Uh, and so let's just bring that full circle. So we talked about the events that are happening at Esther's. That's David. We talked about Smokestack. That's about to be David. Uh, and then February 25 and 26 uh, is going to be, uh, I think it's called Black As You Are on Main Street at, what's the name of it? The Spot. The Spot. Go. So can I go back to the other question? Because I really wanted to say something about the definition of arts and culture. So I was on a webinar once, and somebody who was speaking said, and I just, like I wrote this on a post-it and put it on my window in terms of defining arts and culture and that arts and culture is the activities that we do to make meaning of our lives. And when I, I heard that, I mean, it was like a, the super, I mean, which makes it be like, oh, it's all the things, but it kind of is all the things. So it's, it's like the representation of who we are as people, who we are as a community, who we are historically, um, from our, our backgrounds and our ancestors and those traditions. It sort of is all the things, so anyway. Yeah, we had a, a comment come up from the audience as well saying that, you know, we're talking about culinary arts. We're talking about anything that really in, encompasses creativity, that whether you are supporting it, whether you are going out and making it, it can be anything really that you define it to be that brings you joy. So on that note, I want to thank all of our panelists. Again, this is just the beginning of this conversation. There's so much more we could say. These folks will be around for the rest of the night. So if your question did not get answered, and we apologize if it did not, feel free to come up to any of these folks. They're happy to meet with you. And we thank you so much for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alanda. Thank you, Megan, for facilitating this. And let's thank our panelists one more time. Great resources, great comments. So I promised you I'd take some notes. I don't know how well I did. I hope you can grade me. But uh, listening to some of the data and some of the things that Jason shared earlier, it sounds so like we need a little bit more equity in pay. We need a, a little bit more affordability in the firm form of access. But access is not just about affordability. It may not even always be about affordability. We need to get out more than the library, the Multicultural Family Center, and higher ed. We need to take art and culture to where people are. So uh, get out of our, our, our comfort zone and get out of our current four walls, whatever they are, and take it to where people are. Um, 
some of our challenges, our demographics, relationships, and we heard about that at the end, about how we can build those and how those are going to be, that bridge building is going to be really important to continue to open up the arts and culture. Awareness, I heard a lot, and also somebody mentioned this, um, Alanda, I think you mentioned this, uh, there are some groups that are flying under the radar, some, doing some really cool things, and we don't know about them well enough. Jeez, if there was a media company around here who could... Note to self. Um, we do have a great art section, but we only have one Megan, and, uh, but we need, <laughs> we need more. Um, we need more communication. Uh, some of the challenges are competition for time, competition for resources. How can we get around that? Work together a little bit more. Um, work together with the venues that we want to go to. Work together with some of our peers. How can we mix and, and, and match a little bit more? Um, we talked, let's get out of our comfort zone. Let's try new things. Let's meet new people. And I will tell you, this is, this is a uh, passionate of mine. Um, ever since I came back to Dubuque in 1998. We are a clicky town sometimes. We're also, that's one of our challenges. It's also one of our blessings. When you make friends in Dubuque, generally they're going to be your friends for a long, long time. Um, but we need to also be open to other friends. So like to see the familiar faces, like to see the new faces. So let's, let's go out and make some, some new friends and some, meet some new faces. Let's focus on some uh, programming. Let's as uh, um, I think uh, William mentioned, let's create different kinds of content that looks like the people we want to attract, right? And the people that we want to, to broaden our horizons for a little bit. Money, uh, we heard about the grant program that the city has, so Jenny's apparently has a lot of money to give away. And uh, <laughs> Okay, so it's not that much money, but it's some. But we can make more, we can leverage that. And she's looking for more, aren't we all? Um, some other notes that I have, uh, we need to focus on education. We need to get uh, and devote resources in the school's time and also money and let kids know that it's something that we value and something that is important to our lives and to the community and put the A in STEM and make it STEAM. Um, we also heard a little bit about... Um, it's more than opening doors, it's inviting people. So let's be reaching out a little bit more, let's be a little bit more proactive. Um, we talked about bridge building, locationships, locations and relationships. First Fridays, I learned something, I'd forgotten what BIPOC meant, thank you whoever asked that, uh, because I've seen the term so many times, but I'd forgotten the acronym, so thank you whoever asked about that. And I'm interested to learn more about um, First Fridays. We need more content by young creators. And, and something that Nick mentioned, and I believe this firmly. So if you participate in theater, those are life skills. It's not that very few people who are in opera or who are in theater, whatever it is, go on to become professional in that area. I attribute some of my success um, in being able to stand up here without you know going crazy um, to my time in theater because it helps you learn how to prepare, it helps you learn how to work as a team, helps you um, be able to think on your feet and, and deal with things don't go smoothly. It's theater, but it's also life skills, so let's remember that art is also life skills. Um, what can we do to help? We can give our time and our treasure so we can give money. Um, Jenny says she's got money, but we need more. Uh, so can we do, uh, so we can support a little bit with our time. All of them need volunteers, uh, but they also need financial resources. Art is more than music and painting. It inspires. It is something that is meant to be enjoyed. It's making meaning in our lives. Um, and it's something that's important to our community, and we can, need to continue to grow and diversify and make more inclusive. So with that, I would say thank you all for coming tonight. Those are some of my takeaways. I hope you got that and more. Okay, so the next steps part. Did you have a question? Thank you. So we have some really good people here. I just want to get, so talking about like local, 
So speaking about local young artists, local young creatives in the room, I want everybody who considers themselves a local young creative musician, artist, maker in this room to stand up and just so that everybody has a chance to see your faces. And yeah, thank you for coming. So Jenny, thank you for doing that. This is an opportunity for all of us who weren't standing to reach out to some of these people and see how we can help them pursue their dreams, create their content, their art, and express themselves and make our lives richer. So to your comment, thank you very much. Uh, we have a great team at the Telegraph Herald and TH Media. Um, I, would, I can't help but tell you, in case you didn't notice, last Thursday in, in uh, Des Moines, we were named uh, first place general excellence for the state of Iowa two years in a row. So. We have a good team. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> um, some more takeaways here. Um, community conversations. This sheet of paper is on your table or somewhere near you. Please get involved. The Community Foundation is going to be doing this over the next month. And this is your opportunity to get involved and to share some of your thoughts and experiences. So please get involved in that. Um, I mentioned some of the takeaways that I had about some of the things that we think, say, and do. Um, let's go ahead and make some of those things happen. Um, over here in the next months and years. Um, this is a, a long time coming. It's not a one-time thing. I want to thank again our sponsors one more time, and I'll mention them. Eh, I don't know a different sheet of paper, but I'll go by memory and leave somebody out here. John Deere Community, uh, um, let's see here, Hodge, Cottingham and Butler, NICC, Chamber of Commerce, Greater Dubuque Development. Who am I missing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Green State Credit Union. Thanks to all of our sponsors, especially tonight, Cottingham and Butler. So, all right. This is your time to, to, to visit with folks, to take this away tonight, to go on to next steps and action items. Thanks for coming. Watch for our next uh, event coming in March. And have a great, weather's coming. Have a safe night, everyone. March 9th. Thursday, March 9th. Next one. And we have chicken nachos left. We're not taking them home. Eat some.